Hello. Thank you for joining us again in this awesome series in the book of Revelation. I come to you on behalf of the pastor and membership of New Life Ministries Church in Plato, Missouri. And I come to you in the name of the Lord, sharing with you what I believe the Lord has laid on my heart to share with his church, his people, concerning this time in history and what is to come. Before we get into the message, let us go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we look to you, humbling ourselves under your mighty hand and asking of you wisdom, your wisdom, not the sensual earthly wisdom that's from below, but from the wisdom that comes down from above. For that wisdom is peaceable and it's easily entreated. And we thank you for that because we can come to you and ask you whatever we have a desire to know and that you will reveal what we need to know. And we just thank you, Lord, because whatever you reveal is ours and our children forever. And Father, we give you all the glory, all the honor and all the praise because you are worthy to receive all of those things. There is no one else. You're the only true and living God. I ask that you would anoint these lips of clay, that I would be an oracle of your will and of your word, to, that your people will know you and you alone. I ask this in Jesus' sweet name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Who is worthy? That's the question. We have... Uh, we live in a society right now where everyone is wanting to be in the spotlight or they uh, have attention. Uh, we even have a, uh, a term that, uh, and label that we placed on certain people who are out there. We call them influencers and um, they want to make their mark, so to speak, on the world stage where everyone will consult them, look to them, and, and, uh, and know of them. But all these things are temporary at best, and, uh, and they are deceptive at worst. We are in a dangerous time right now. Paul calls it perilous. He said there will, there will come a time in the last days will be perilous times. Uh, that means that anything can happen at any moment that would be detrimental to your life, to your liberty, to your future. That's the society, that's the time, that's the environment that we're living in right now. And um, it is such a blessing that God cared enough about you and about me and each of us that he would over 2000 years ago reveal through his son, Jesus Christ, to John the Apostle to share with the seven churches of Asia Minor and therefore the whole world uh, of Christendom and even through the centuries to us to let us know what to expect and to let us also know that he's got it in control and to, for us not to uh, give up, give in, or give out. We look at the fifth chapter of the book of Revelation, what we will be dealing with today. And um, there's so many things here, and, and I'm not going to be able to cover everything that I would love to cover. Uh, it's such a joy to me. This is, I think, out of, this is, this is one of the, well, the whole book is just awesome to me, but this right here, this, this chapter, is one that is so encouraging, I believe, to the believer and, to, and so reassuring to the believer. Uh, let's get into it. Verse 1, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a scroll, having been written inside and out, and having been sealed with seven seals. And I'm reading to you from the Logos translation. Uh, of the Bible. 
Here's that word, that number rather, seven again, complete, full, total. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? Hence our title today, Who is Worthy? If you look at the panels that uh, are arranged on the screen below my uh, image, uh, you will see uh, the first uh, panel. You see the Father on his throne. And if you look closely, you see in his right hand uh, an object. That's the scroll. Then you look at the second panel, that's kind of a, a close-up view of the scroll with seven seals. That's how it looked in all. Uh, and then you see in the third panel, you see a lamb. We're going to deal with those as we deal in this chapter. A strong angel. Uh, I like the way this is put um, a strong angel mighty angel powerful angel um, full of strength uh, courageous valiant it's a strong angel uh, it could be implied or intimated here a, a warrior angel, an angel that, that is not, uh, that has no fear, a bold angel, but a strong angel. Um, proclaimed with a loud voice, a commanding voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? Now this is this is in this day and time that that uh, John lived in, uh, when a, when a, when an object, be it a book or scroll in this, this instance, or a a door, or a uh, or just like at the tomb of of uh, the Lord Jesus when they rolled a stone and they put a seal upon it. Under penalty of death was that seal to be broken by anyone that was not authorized. If you weren't authorized to break that seal, you could be executed on the spot. No questions asked. This is why it was such a, a problem for the, uh, the soldiers who were set to guard the uh, the tomb of the Lord Jesus, that when the stone was rolled away, and all, and they went and told the the chief priests what had happened, and they were in fear for their lives because they knew what the penalty was to allow someone to come, because they were supposed to to guard that tomb uh, with their lives, but of course there were strong angels. A strong angel showed up, and. Uh, his countenance was as the lightning, and he rolled a stone away. That stone, which took a number of men to move, it was it was uh, very heavy. One man couldn't do it, uh, but this one angel just came and rolled it away. And when they uh, shared with the chief priest what had happened, the the chief priest told them, "said Don't worry about it." They bribed him and told him. What you do, if somebody asks you, you tell them that his disciples came and took the body. That's what you tell them. Now, here were the same disciples that were cowering in a, in the, behind the doors, closed doors, hiding out in Jerusalem, afraid for their lives. They're going to be bold enough to go and take on the watch that was uh, watching the uh, tomb and overpower them and take the body so that they could perpetuate a, uh, a lie. Doesn't make sense. It's not logical. It doesn't make any sense. And yet, 
when you want to believe something strong enough, you will reject the truth and believe a lie. When you really want to believe it strong enough, you reject any kind of logic, any kind of sense, and you'll lay hold on that which is absolutely idiocy. Look around you. Turn on your TV. Turn on your radio. Uh, get on your social media. You can see evidence of all, all kinds of evidence toward this, uh, this aim where people willingly blind themselves to the truth and embrace lies. And so they, they told the, 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 uh, the soldiers, we'll take care of the governor so that you're not, uh, you're not punished because they had some things on the governor. How much do you love the truth? That's the question you have to ask. Are you really after the truth? Jesus told Pilate that uh, his kingdom was built upon truth. Pilate asked the question without waiting for an answer. What is truth? But I'm asking you, and the Bible is asking you, and the Lord Jesus is asking you through the Holy Spirit, Do you love the truth? Do you really want the truth? Or do you just want uh, whatever way you can make the truth line up to what you want it to be? And if, if it's not what you want it to be, then you will reject the truth. Dangerous position to be in. Dangerous position. Uh, attitude to have or mindset to have. But this angel asked this question, verse 2 of the fifth chapter of Revelation, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And then verse 3, and no one in heaven above or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll nor to look at it. No one was authorized. Now, where was this scroll at? It was in the right hand of him that sat on the throne. It was in the right hand of he who is the only one with direct authority anywhere. That's God the Father. As we said in our last video cast, all authority other than God's direct authority is delegated authority. It is authority that is granted. It is not authority that is inherent in the receiver or the bearer of it. So your kings, your uh, leadership, whoever, whatever position they're in, wherever they are, they are given this authority, it's delegated to them, but it's on a time scale. It is, it is not something that they possess forever. They possess it for a season. They are limited in their possession of it. Whereas with God, I love the way it's portrayed over in Deuteronomy when he says, I lift my hand toward heaven and live forever. All authority is his. Jesus declares that all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. And then Paul comes along in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, and reiterates that, that the Father has placed all authority in the Son until he has put down all sin, all rebellion. He has put it all down and cleaned up everything. And then once the kingdom is fully established and sin has been dealt with, death has been dealt with, hell has been dealt with, uh, the judging that needs to be judged has been dealt with, then he will present the kingdom back to the Father. Complete, full, and perfect. Verse 3, it says, And no one in heaven, above or on the earth or under the earth, was able to open the scroll or to look at it. And I began to weep, verse 4, 
I began to weep much because no one was found worthy to open the scroll, nor to look at it. Have you ever had such a passion to see something or to know something and then it was denied or it seemed like it would be denied and you would not get the chance to experience that or whatever and it hits you so hard that you want to weep. You ever been in that situation? I have. So I can I can relate with John here. Maybe not to the extent because I've never had the opportunity that he had of watching something. John understood this scroll to to a degree. From what I'm what I'm getting, he understood what this scroll meant. When we look at him that sit that he, he that is sitting on the throne and in his right hand, the right hand, uh, the right arm represented strength and power and rule. So, uh, it being in the right hand of him who sits on the throne, it was in his power, it was in his control, it was under his authority. And, uh, if we look at these the scroll as being the complete uh, deed, so to speak, title deed to creation, then we understand why John was weeping. We understand why he was overwhelmed with grief. You say, well, why is that the title? Why, how could you say that? Well, Psalms 24 tells us the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world and all they that dwell therein. It all belongs to him. God owns creation. Do you understand that? Because he created, he is the creator. All things come from him. Without him, nothing was created. All things that we know, that we see, they were, they were created by God. So he's the owner. He didn't sell it to anyone. He didn't give it to anyone. He, he, is, he retains ownership of it. Paul tells us this way. He gets more personal about it. He says to us, Mr. and Mrs. Christian, or Miss Christian, uh, know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost? In other words, God's spirit dwells in you. Then he, he goes even further. He says, uh, we are bought with a price. We are not our own. You don't belong to yourself. It's not your thing. You, The choices that you make where you have not consulted God is an insult to him, to his authority. Because you are taking it upon yourself to operate as he is operating. You make a choice about something that does not belong to you. You make a choice about your life that doesn't belong to you, belongs to God. Your choice should be in line with God's choice. You should be seeking his desire, his will. And when something comes up, your question should be, Lord, should I do this or should I do that? What should I do? You should ask the question of him who sits on the throne. Being the title deed, that means that whoever would possess that, whoever would have the authority to possess that uh, scroll, would also have the authority, the right, the power, and the ability to reveal what's in the in the scroll and to control those revelations or events okay the information so to speak that's in the scroll in verse 4 he says he began to weep much because no one was found worthy to open the scroll nor to look at it Verse 5, but one of the elders, 
We're in the throne room. You got the 20 and four elders that are around the throne. One of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has overcome to open the scroll and its seven seals. He's earned the right to open the scrolls. He's earned the right to reveal what's in the scroll. And I saw in the midst of the throne of the four living beings and of the four living beings and in the midst of the elders a lamb standing as if slain having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent forth to all the earth. As we dealt with in the last video cast, the Lord Jesus Christ is the only one who had the fullness of the Holy Spirit in him and upon him. All others have a measure of the Spirit given to them. But he was given the Spirit without measure. Paul, in, in his letter to the church at Colossae, says that in him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the fullness of divinity, the fullness of the Holy Spirit is in him bodily, complete. He was filled up. We say, uh, you know, we seek to be filled with the Spirit, no, but what we're filled with of the Spirit is a small measure compared to, to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. A lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. There's the seven again, that completeness, uh, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Then he came and took out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. I want to touch on something else here. Uh, when he says the lion of the tribe of Judah, he, he, he directly says it. Now, we talked in the last video cast about revelation, that the revelation was given. Uh, it was of God. It was given to Jesus Christ. And Jesus, the Lord, our, our Lord and Savior, gave it to John as well as to all the other prophets and the other apostles. And, and even today, if you have a revelation from God, it comes from the Lord Jesus Christ, from his complete revelation. Only Jesus Christ has the complete revelation and purpose of God. All of us know a part of it. And only the part that he has given to us. And you should treasure that. Because everybody does not have that revelation, that understanding. It's a gift. But here we look at, when he says the line of the tribe of Judah, talks about Judah. We go back to Genesis. And when Jacob or Israel was pronouncing blessings upon his sons before he died, he said the scepter would not uh, depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from beneath his, between his feet until Shiloh comes. Shiloh is peace. The, uh, the scepter is the rule, the power. It was always given to Judah to be the lead. And Judah's name means praise. So praise has a uh, an authority or a right that other uh, manifestations don't have. Praise has a right, an inherent right to some things. The other thing is, he says, behold the lamb, behold the lion, rather, of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. It was prophesied that it would come through Judah, the ruler, the ultimate ruler from God, for his people would come through Judah. David was of the tribe of Judah, and David became the king that all other kings were judged against, as far as God's people were concern and ruling God's people. And uh, we know David was, did not measure up to the perfection that, uh, of holiness that was demanded, but he was a man after God's own heart 
that God still used his king, his kingdom, his throne as the uh, uh, the standard or as the prototype of the, of the kingdom that was to come and the throne that was to come. Matter of fact, the Lord Jesus is, is going to sit on the throne of David, his father. The other thing I want to touch on is where it says the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, the devil tries to imitate. And Peter says, be sober and vigilant for your adversary, which is the devil, goeth about as a roaring lion. He doesn't say that he is a lion. He says he goes about. He mimics a lion. He's a snake that tries to sound like a lion. And that's why when you he, he talks big things and everything and threats and whatever. But when you actually see him, you see that he's not who he says he is. In other words, he's a liar. But here is the true deal. Jesus is the real deal. The lion of the tribe of Judah. He has overcome. How did he overcome? He overcame death, hell, and the grave. On the cross, he defeated Paul says it in his letter to the uh, Colossians. He also says that uh, Jesus took all the offenses that were against us and nailed them to his cross. And then he says he defeated uh, the, uh, the opposition, so to speak, uh, and made an open show of them. In other words, just as a conqueror comes and brings those that he's conquered and, and makes a show of them in a parade to show that he has a power over them, Jesus did the same thing. That's why he says all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. But look at what verse 7 says. Then he came and took out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. He didn't say he just came and stood there and it was given to him, but he reached forth and took it out of the hand of his father. That's worthy. That is worthy. That's power. That's authority. And when he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Look at this. Each having a harp and golden bowls being filled with incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And we talked about the, the council and the 24 elders and all. So we, it says, which is the, 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 the prayers of the saints. These uh, are intermediaries, so to speak, that uh, when the prayers of the saints go forth and all, they're like sweet smelling incense. What the sacrifices used to do, these now do, uh, coming into the, the sweet aroma, the spirit turns them into a sweet aroma before the Father. Incense is used to uh, bring forth uh, a fresh smell or uh, a wonderful fragrance, uh, an aromatic fragrance that will will uh, be pleasing to whoever it is. You don't go and buy bad influence, uh, in, incense, uh, incense that's going to be uh, uh, bad smelling, foul smelling. You don't you don't go buy that if you, get, if you got good sense. But uh, you want something that's going to be fragrant, something that's going to be pleasing and delightful. And the prayers of the saints here, the, the, in, the, the bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the saints. This means that when you pray, you delight the Lord. When you pray, you bring joy to the Lord. You bring, you bring a, 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 a sweet smelling savor to the Lord when you pray. Verse 9, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. This is how you overcame. And it, and we do the same thing. Said so we will later on we will read where it says they overcame uh, by the testimony, by the word of the testimony and the blood of the Lamb. Look at this. And you redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and language and people and nation. Now notice this. You redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, language, and people, and nation. Now, these are not human beings that's talking. These are the elders and the living creatures that are talking. 
you redeemed us to God by your blood. And out of every tribe and language and people and nation, Christ on the cross redeemed the whole creation, not just the natural, but the spiritual too. He, he all creation, Paul says in Romans 8 chapter, is yearning and, and, and travailing for the manifestation of the sons of God. Read it for yourself. See how all this revelation is tied in together, but it's given through Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, you won't get the revelation and you won't understand it. And have made them kings and priests to our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard, as it were, the voice of many angels around the throne and the living beings and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and a thousand thousands. In other words, unlimited, infinite, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb. Could you just imagine just for a moment, you're there and you're hearing all this going on? Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive the power and the wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Let me tell you something. When you praise God, when you praise the Lord Jesus Christ, when you glorify them, you're not uh, giving them something that they're not due. You're not patronizing them. You're not flattering them. You're giving them what you owe them. We owe God worship. We owe God praise. We owe God obedience. He is worthy to receive. He's, he's earned it. It's his. Verse 13, and every creature which, was, which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power to him that sits upon the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Amen. You may say, wait a minute. What do you mean every creature? That's, the scripture tells us that every eye is going to behold them. It also tells us that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. They may not say it now, but they're going to say it out of every mouth. Even the one that has deceived the whole world, the one that has tempted mankind throughout, down through the centuries, even that one whom we call the devil, that old serpent, the dragon, is going to confess out of his mouth. Jesus is Lord. He's going to bow down to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every demonic spirit, every fallen angel, every politician, every king, every tyrant is going to confess out of their mouth, Jesus is Lord. Verse 14, and the four living beings said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Who is worthy? He's worthy. Who has a right to demand your obedience? The Lord Jesus Christ. Who has a right to direct your life? The Lord Jesus Christ. Who has a right to control your destiny? The Lord Jesus Christ. He has a right. He's worthy to receive all power, all authority, all the honor, all the praise, all the glory, even in the prayer that he uh, left as a pattern for us. At the end, it says, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, thank you for the lamb, as John the Baptist said, for us to behold him, to look upon him, the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. That lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, before anything was created or anyone was created, the lamb had already 
given his blood, his life in your mind to redeem creation so that creation could go forward and be realized irrespective of sin, irrespective of any uh, shortness, uh, falling short of the of the uh, of the standard that you have set in your holiness. The Lamb of God would redeem that creation and bring it into perfection so that it, all things would be new and all things would glorify you and reflect your majesty, your glory. Father, we love you. We thank you for that lamb. We thank you for that lion of the tribe of Judah that's able to protect us from the enemy that's going about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But whom, if we resist, if we humble ourselves under your mighty hand, we resist him, he has to flee. He can't stand up against the lion of the tribe of Judah. We love you, Father. We thank you. We bless you. We praise you. We honor you. We glorify your name. There is none like you. You are the true and living God. We thank you for your mercy, and your grace, your, your grace that you have given to us that we didn't earn and we could never earn and forgiven us of our sins. For we have sinned and we do sin. We do fall short. But because of the love that you have exhibited to us and, and bestowed upon us through your son, Jesus Christ. We're redeemed, we're restored, we're forgiven. We thank you, Father. We bless you, we praise you. Let your anointing and your presence be with your people, not as a visitation, but as a habitation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. God bless you, saints. Until next time, go with God.